Thank you, and it's a, it's a great uh, pleasure and an honor to be here at this uh, institute. Um, I am, uh, for many years now, uh, a minister and before that a deputy minister, but my origins is in the academic world, and I was for many years at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. So I always feel very much at home when I'm in a, 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 an institute of, of learning and, and foreign policy research, of course. And I'm very happy also to have this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts, Norway's thoughts, on, um, on the Arctic. It is definitely a region that is um, characterized both by uh, major opportunity, but also by challenges ranging from ecological to political. And I think it is a topic that should interest countries, even if they are not directly Arctic nations. And we do notice that increasingly that the countries in many parts of the world have a, a great interest for what's going on. Before Christmas, I gave a, a lecture on many of the similar issues in Singapore. Uh, they are not particularly Arctic in climate, even, even less than uh, Dublin, uh, although they are one degree north of uh, equator, so at least they're there on the right side of the uh, dividing line. But their interest, of course, is because of the changing nature of shipping. So just to illustrate that there's a broad, and i come back to explain why, but there is a, there is a, it's a broad range of countries, environments, uh, which are now becoming interested in the, the major changes that is going on in the Arctic, what it uh, means, and what it can imply uh, for, the, for the future. Uh, Norway, of course, has a strong polar tradition. We used to do exploitation and exploration uh, of both the North Pole and the South Pole, but uh, Ireland also has a uh, polar history uh, with uh, Sir Ernst, Ernest Henry Shackleton, uh, who was engaged and who is quite well known actually in Norway due to uh, our, uh, our polar history. And also uh, a gentleman called Mr. Tom Crean, uh, who was engaged in several of the South Pole explorations and then went on to set up a, a, a public house or a, pub, or a small pub uh, in, um, uh, in the country Kerry, uh, which was called the South Pole Inn. And later he appeared, as I've been told, in the Guinness advertisement saying that Guinness is good for you even on the South Pole. So there is, a, there is an Irish uh, history as well to, uh, to the Pole. I have some uh, slides, I hope you can all uh, see them, uh, about uh, the Arctic as uh, the new crossroads. And what I'm referring to is a crossroads uh, also in geographical terms between three of the most dynamic economies in the world, or, or rather the three most dynamic economies of the world, Eastern Asia, uh, Europe, uh, and uh, North America. Uh, the, uh, the climate is changing fast. That is, of course, bad news. And I want to preface everything I'm saying about the opportunity by making very clear that one of the reasons uh, behind this increased interest in the Arctic is climate change, ecological change, and that is definitely not good news. It is a sign of global warming, and global warming is faster on the poles than uh, in other parts of the uh, planet. Uh, a 2% uh, 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 Celsius degree increase uh, generally on the planet will lead to a 4% uh, increase on both the poles because of the, the, the way uh, the, the climate works. So it's sort of a major thing, and what we can see in the Arctic is not created in the Arctic, but the consequences are felt uh, in the Arctic, obviously. This is a polar projection of the world. We very much like this map in Norway because it shows how central we are. You know, the, uh, the more traditional maps that you used to look at put us very far away and, you know, uh, up at the uh, end of the world, but uh, here we're much more central, so we prefer this one. I think there's a, yeah. And um, uh, Ireland is over here. So it's on the map, uh, and uh, not that far, if you look closely, to, to what's going uh, up here. This is, of course, a projection when there is still quite a lot of ice. But imagine when this ice is melting, uh, which it is. It's not, it, first, the, the ice cap is going down. I have a picture of that later. It's, uh, the, the ice cap is, is generally being reduced, but it's also moving from east to west. So we put more ice over at the Canadian side, and there's less Canadian and Alaska side and less on our side, which among other things means that the access to further north and the access to the northeast passage and eventually to a polar transport route between Europe and Asia is, uh, is presenting itself as quite relevant. When we talk about Arctic issues or high north issues as we 
uh, as we uh, used to do in the Norwegian setting, uh, it's, it's a multitude of issues that comes up. It's about, uh, of course, the issue of security, both international security, but also sec safety and security issues. How do we make sure that we have good control of those issues? Uh, climate, as the driver already mentioned. Uh, a question of jurisdiction, uh, what belongs to whom? And how do we solve potential disputes about what belongs to whom? Uh, issues of shipping, uh, first the opportunity to do much more destination shipping, meaning shipping that is not going through the Arctic, but further north in the Arctic. Just one example on Russia. Uh, Russia is uh, hit by global warming in several respects, but my point out two. One of them is that many areas in Russia's north is now accessible by ship uh, in the longer time of the year. Sort of the, so the summer in that sense is getting longer. At the same time, the, uh, the melting of the permafrost, the permanently frozen parts of the tundra, is changing. So that is also melting, and that is actually challenging some of the traditional on-land transport routes, railways, roads, even cities, which is built just on top of the tundra, is breaking down, literally. I've seen pictures of a Soviet-era city of blocks, which is actually collapsing because the, it was built on frozen land and it's not uh, frozen any longer. So they both have to and can uh, do more of the transport uh, in the north, it's destination shipping. But also then, in, uh, increasingly, transit uh, shipping is becoming increasingly relevant. But the Arctic is a large area, and there is no absolutely agreed definition of what it is. The sort of easiest and most, uh, 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 you know, the mo maybe most known definition is everything north of the Arctic Circle, which is a rather significant part of, uh, of the world, actually. Everything from 66 uh, point, uh, uh, six seven and upwards uh, degrees north. And there is also diff um, different, more sort of temperature range uh, definitions. But anyway, it, there, is a number, there are a number of countries who are actually in the Arctic. Half of Nor more than half of Norway's territory is in the Arctic. And there's a lot of people living in the Arctic, uh, in Norway, in Alaska, uh, in, in Russia, uh, uh, and of course on Greenland, so, uh, where, why, which is why Denmark should be added to the list of Arctic countries. It's just an Arctic country through through uh, Denmark, uh, through, through um, uh, Greenland. Here's a, a picture of the, uh, the changing uh, ice landscape. And uh, last year, we had the, the lowest recorded uh, extension of the ice cap uh, in, uh, uh, in, in recorded time, actually. So everything, although it's not completely linear, uh, because it goes a little bit up and down, the sort of the long uh, trend line is that this is going to continue. And we have already done things on the globe, which will make it you know, continue to do, go in this direction, even if we all went on bicycles, stopped driving cars, stopped heating our houses today. So the sort of long-term effects of already existing, uh, should we say, investments in, um, uh, in global warming. On the opportunity side, this means that there, th there are new areas uh, that become interesting for exploitation of energy, uh, for instance. This is a LNG uh, facility in the very high Norwegian north and an LNG transport ship uh, which puts uh, liquid fried uh, gas and export them to basically anywhere you'd like. They can go to North America. The demand is decreasing because of the uh, fast uh, growth of American self-dependence on, on energy or to Europe uh, or also to Asia where the demand is rising. When, when, um, when gas transports become more LNG-based, it also means that the gas as a commodity, the nature of, of the commodity is changing. Because traditionally, gas was, has been transported, and still is, of course, in pipelines, which requires a, a, a very long-term agreement first to build it, and then in order to finance it, there must be a continued agreement, the security of demand, security of supply, for many, many years. Now, with the LNG, you can put the gas on the ship and you can sail it. And just like oil, you can actually sell the contents on the ship while the ship is sailing. So it's a completely different uh, commodity in the international markets. And uh, access to, to exploitation further north is becoming possible. Access to transport, all this comes together. So the Arctic is becoming a significant energy region. Norway, of course, is a major exporter of both oil and gas, but 
in Norway as well as other uh, parts of the world, the, the percentage of oil is going down relative to the gas and the percentage of oil gas is going up. We actually actively promote natural gas as an important bridge to in, in uh, two countries that are undergoing sort of an, um, what the Germans call the Energiewende or the, or the sort of the striving towards more renewable uh, energy, but also as a permanent composition of a more environmentally friendly uh, energy because it's the cleanest of the non-renewables. So it's less clean than um, hydroelectric and, uh, and so on, but it's more clean than obviously than coal and oil and so on. Uh, so, so this is important for us, but it's even more important for Russia and it's important in Alaska and it's important in Canada. Uh, and, and this is a big thing. The American Geological Survey is suggesting that more than 20% of the remaining undiscovered uh, oil and gas res uh, reserves uh, are likely to be in what we refer to as the Arctic. This is also an area uh, of uh, very rich fishing uh, potential, and not only potential, it's, it's being uh, utilized. We have a large uh, fishing fleet, of course. They can now go further north, so can others. Uh, they, and they have to because the fish is also changing their patterns. With global warming, certain types of fish stocks are uh, looking for colder waters. Um, cod, for instance, are, are, are moving where they actually go because of the changing temperature. So uh, there are new issues, new opportunities. This is, we see this as, you know, on a global sense, a strategic issue. Because we are currently 7 billion people on the planet. We are... Uh, some calculations suggest that will be at least 9 billion before it sort of flattens out. And there's hardly enough uh, food to, that can be produced on land. But there is a, a, a tremendous potential in producing more proteins at sea, but only if we manage our water as well. So not only managing the fish stocks, but also managing the, the, um, uh, the ecological uh, conditions under which the fish live. So this is also a major issue. Uh, and of course, the intersection between energy exploitation and fish is clearly important and needs a holistic approach. Minerals. There are, in the Arctic, on, on land and, and offshore, there are significant um, uh, precious metals and other minerals which on, uh, for which there is a high demand. And Norway, surprisingly to some, is now again becoming a major exporter of metals and of, of minerals. Uh, this is actually um, loading a ship with iron ore, which is going from, uh, from um, Kirkenes uh, in uh, northern Norway, the n most northeastern corner of Norway, to China or Japan, to the northwest route. It's happening. It's not sort of science fiction. It's happening. This ship has sailed. It has arrived. And there are several transports like that. So it's also an, a kind of a mineral region. Shipping. When, rather than if, I say when, but when the Northeast Passage has become, you know, an even more commercially attractive um, region or, or transport route, it will reduce the time it takes to sail from Yokohama to Rotterdam or the other way around by 40%. It's 40% shorter. Uh, and at least in summertime, uh, where there is hardly any ice, you can go at almost normal speeds, which means it's also 40% faster. And you avoid sort of conflictual areas like the Malacca Straits or the, you know, the Bay of Alden and so on. Uh, it, it, as, I, as I told this audience I referred to in Singapore, it will take many, many, many years before this is the dominant route. This is it's not just about like a couple of years. This is a dominant route, but it's a su supplementary route which is going to be interested for cert interesting for certain types of shipping. Which also, and, and you know, when this really is happening, it means that what, if you remember the first picture of the polar cap, the traditional conception that the, the world sort of continues up to the North Pole and that's the end, will then be substituted with the conception that the world goes up to the North Pole and then it continues on the other side. Which of course was always true, but conceptually not the way we, we saw it. It's just a way to connect to other continents, and it's going to happen big time. Uh, between all these issues, shipping, which also has ecological dimensions, first because there is a risk of accidents, of course, sp oil spills, but also because shipping itself does affect the natural habitat. It brings waters from one part of the, you know, from one type of climate and one habitat to another. 
uh, oil and gas exploitation, fishing itself, other uh, exploitation of minerals, all of this, of course, has to be managed uh, in a, a cohesive uh, and integrated fashion between countries who are interested in this. Uh, that's an ambition I think every Arctic state shares, but of course going from the ambition to actually doing it is going to be challenging. So there is um, uh, a lot of research going on. Uh, the Spitsbergen Islands, or Svalbard as we call them, are uh, increasingly a center of international research. Uh, a number of countries uh, are, have established, have used the right to free the free access to establish oneself in Svalbard, uh, also to establish research stations. And there's a lot of specialized investigations going up, uh, going on in this, uh, which including in the, in the small town of Ny Ålesund, or New Ålesund, which is the northernmost place where people live the whole year around in the world. Uh, and, um, and, and that is on Arctic research, it's on climate research, and it's on you know, how to uh, use the potential. And it's, a, it's an international cooperation arena in itself. What is incredibly important, that's sort of my, if, if you want one takeaway message from this speech, uh, which is more important than everything else I say, is that the International Convention of the, or the UN Convention of the Law of the Seas applies to the Arctic. Uh, this is not only me saying as the Norwegian foreign minister, but every Arctic state agrees that any dispute should be settled under the auspices of the institution set up under uh, the Law of the Seas Convention. That's very important. That includes America. Despite all the fact that the U.S. never has ratified, although several presidents from both parties have tried, uh, uh, does not preclude that the U.S. actually explicitly declares that they see themselves as bound by the obligations of the UNCLOS. Very important. Uh, unfortunately for them, they are not entitled to the rights. But, you know, why, so I often question in the U.S., why do you want to join in a way where you only have obligations and no rights? That's up to them. Uh, but, they, um, but that's what they do, and so does Russia, so does uh, Denmark, so does Canada, so do we. And all the Arctic states, states agree on this. Th this should, of course, be obvious. But uh, in order to make sure there was no disagreement about, uh, on this, we had a meeting of the, of the directly Arctic countries, those who were directly affected by, uh, you know, were actually in the Arctic, uh, in Ilulisat in Greenland in 2008, and came up with the foreign minister's declaration just confirming that this is the agreement. And there are less and less disputed areas. We settled our issue, I'll, I'll show you a map afterwards, we settled our issue with the Russians after 40 years of negotiations. Just before Christmas, uh, one of the remaining disagreements between Canada and Denmark was solved in the Lincoln Sea. Um, and there were several other uh, processes which suggest that less and less of the Arctic is actually disputed. And it's important to say that because there is a popular uh, conception in many parts of the world that there is a kind of race for the Arctic. It's, it's a kind of Klondike. It's free for all and who comes first and those who come first can grab the resources. That's not true. Most of the interesting resources are actually, uh, are, are actually within what is the agreed boundaries or agreed legal uh, economic zone of an, either country. Uh, and that means that this is in principle an ocean that is very well, uh, you know, very well um, uh, placed for being an ocean of cooperation and not conflict. And that has been very central to our high north policies, is to say that this is the high north, but there is low tension. Uh, Norway and um, Russia, uh, originally the Norway and the Soviet Union actually, uh, has had for 40 years until 2010, which means from around 1970, disagreed about, about where the uh, delineation should be between their two economic zones. But what is extremely important, is not the details of what these sort of stippled lines are, but is that Russia and the Soviet Union before them agreed that this should be settled according to international law. There was not like in, the, in some other parts of the world where where there is a dis dispute between those who are saying these are historic rights anyway and those who claim international law. I mean, we agreed that international law applies. It was just that their lawyers had an interpretation more favorable to them and our lawyers had an interpretation more favorable to us. Surprise. Um, 
160, 176,000 square kilometers of quite attractive water, so it's quite significant. Um, uh, but eventually we were able to draw a line, and that was based on, uh, obviously, political will to get it settled, but also uh, based on an actual uh, closing of the legal disagreement by good lawyers on both sides, or, or good legal experts on both sides, agreeing uh, about more and more of what would be the final settlement over many years. And, and it's, it's very good to say that for us that we now have no disagreements with anyone in our neighborhood. We have neither land border nor maritime uh, sovereign borders nor economic zone border disputes with anyone. And that's increasingly the case for the Arctic. I think it's very important. Just look at the South China Sea to see a, a comparative example. This um, rapprochement over time has led to a, a quite good cooperation with Russia. This is from the Russia-Norwegian border. Uh, you see normal people up there. Uh, there. There is people to people contact, more and more border crossing. Uh, and the state to state relationship between my country and Russia is good and stable and predictable. We, of course, uh, are seeing some of the same domestic developments within Russia when it comes to the extent of uh, democracy and, and, and uh, NGO laws and some which we take up and criticize as everybody else, but the bilateral relationship is, is, is good. At the same time, the, uh, the Kola Peninsula is, remains the most important military base of Russia. The, most of the strategic uh, armory, the, 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 the nuclear weapons, submarine-based or aircraft-based, are in the high north. Not because of us, not because of the Arctic, but simply because that's the most interesting place for them to be for, uh, for strategic purposes. So we are, at the same time, a neighbor of uh, still quite potent military power just across the border from us. This is a... Uh, this is a nuclear-powered and uh, nuclear-armed um, uh, submarine. This class of submarines holds 16 uh, nuclear missiles each, and is an important part of the second strike capability of Russia, which they take, still take quite seriously. So, and so we also see the Russians, you know, in their military activities. I used to be defense minister. Uh, and was quite a lot in, involved in this. And this was, you know, if not weekly, it was quite often. This is a Norwegian F-16 uh, meeting a Russian strategic bomber outside, on the right side of our borders, not violating anything, but following the Norwegian border down to the United Kingdom uh, area of responsibility. And we respond to that by going up and calling them and escorting them down. So we have this engagement as well. And that for balance, it should be said. So we have a rather significant part of our military capabilities uh, in the north, but not directed against anyone, not because we think this is an area of conflict, simply because there is a lot to look after, and the military is a part uh, of that endeavor. Then towards the end there, I'll mention the, um, uh, the main international uh, institutions. Of course, I did mention the Law of the Seas Convention and uh, all the bodies that you know, comes out of that. But we have also, over the last year, strengthened the Arctic Council. And the Arctic Council is, has eight members. Uh, that is the, that's Russia, Canada, US, uh, Denmark, Norway, uh, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland, and a number of observers. And there is a big debate in the Arctic Council and around it about whether to open up for more observers, including the European Union as such, and China, and, uh, and uh, South Korea, and a number of other interested parties. Our line is that we should open up because it's, it's good that these countries and institutions are interested in what's going on in the Arctic. And also because we think it's better that we use the forum that is already in place rather than creating an alternative forum. But there are, I think it's publicly known, different views about that within the Arctic Council, to which extent we should keep it as a closed shop and to which extent we should open up to more observers. Members are likely to remain the original members who are closer to actually being in the Arctic. Um, this is, one, this is a, a Chinese uh, uh, vessel uh, who's been very active over the last uh, year in the Arctic. Um, it's called the Snow Dragon. It's a very nice Chinese name. Uh, and the Snow Dragon is there because China, for perfectly logical reasons, is interested in what's going on. 
It's interested in understanding what's the potential. China is interested in resources uh, all over the world, and they're in, they have a significant research effort, uh, and they're more than welcome, but it's sort of one of the players that we are seeing uh, increasingly active also in the Arctic. So back to my point, this is not only for directly active con uh, you know, countries actually boarding the Arctic as such. Um, I'll, I'll uh, uh, end there. Uh, this is just a reminder that uh, this is a place where people live. It's not the kind of ultima thule where you find no life. Uh, people have their normal uh, uh, lives uh, up here, uh, like in uh, Svolvær. Just one example of many uh, sort of small uh, towns uh, or cities on the, um, uh, on the uh, our Nordic Rim, and also in other countries. You see that people live there, and more and more people will live in the Arctic both because it is possible and secondly because there is something to do there. And I think that it's, what I, again, takeaway message. This is an, uh, it, it's a, it's a, an area that illustrates uh, both some of the serious challenges confronting the globe uh, when it comes to uh, global warming and its consequences. It opens up for a set of opportunities. They have to be managed because they will not manage themselves, but they can be managed through good international cooperation, which is why my government has put this on its very top of its foreign policy agenda to promote good cooperation, good norms, and good understanding of what's going on in the Arctic.